If you spend your days paying attention to the news of the world, you can feel like humanity is not especially stable these days. Even if you don't pay much attention to the news, you can wonder what's up with people. An event coming to Ashland next weekend says volumes with its title, Finding Your Sanity in an Insane World. It features speakers talking about how we got here and how we might get to firmer ground. Three guests join us. Jordan Pease is conference organizer and the director of the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library here in the studio with me. Jordan, welcome. Jeff, thanks for having us. Jennifer Margulis, she is a well-known uh, person here on JPR. She's a science journalist and a JPR contributor. Jennifer, good to see you. Thanks for having me, Jeff. And Daniel Sheehan joins us by phone. He's a civil rights trial lawyer, an author, and an educator. Daniel, welcome to you. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. It's good to have you all. So Jordan, start us off. What is the Architects of the New Paradigm, which is the overall umbrella for this event and others like it? Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library has produced several events like this over the years. Um, we started in Ashland on A Street with the Lending Library 2002. In 2015, we started this uh, Architects of the New Paradigm conference series. So this is the fifth in that series, the uh, Finding Your Sanity in an Insane World. So uh, the sessions have been going on for several years. They're not strictly connected to current political division, it would appear. Um, no, <laughs> not at all, actually. <laughs> Uh, we try to, uh, I hear Daniel laughing because <laughs> he knows the philosophy that the library takes toward the work that we do. So it's it's, it's primarily giving people um, opportunity to learn about things that aren't typically in uh, the mainstream news uh, sources. As I look at the uh, at the sessions that you have within the Finding Your Sanity in an Insane World, and this is Saturday, December 14th at Ashland Hills Hotel, uh, psychopaths and sociopaths seem to be major discussion topics. Why? <laughs> Why? Well... Uh, I'm going to let Daniel Sheehan speak to that a little bit, and Jennifer has some perspective on that, too. In brief, my perspective, the library's perspective, organizing this event, uh, addressing these difficult subjects, especially around the holidays, perhaps, uh, although perhaps timely in that sense, too. Uh, well, uh, metaphysical library, so these ideas of meta-issues. So if we start to identify and recognize um, issues that are up a hierarchy of, of challenges that our society faces, in an idealistic sense, uh, other um, problems become addressed. So that's why we decided to tackle this particular subject. Now, Daniel Sheehan, I noticed that uh, your session is called Sociopaths and Scoundrels in High Places. Talk about uh, about your exposure. It sounds like you've uh, you've gotten quite a bit in some of the uh, the law cases you've been involved with over the years. Oh, yeah. Now, the, it's, it's going to be inevitable that uh, people come to, un to get a sense of partly what we're talking about, a subtext of what we're talking about, is the process that... Uh, that Donald Trump has been accused of using. There's a term that one runs into called gaslighting. Uh, and, and you hear it now and then, and people don't know exactly what that means. I wonder what that means. It comes from an old 1938 uh, play that was later turned into a movie in 1944 uh, called Gaslight. Uh, and what it is is that when a particular person in a position of power or influence attempts to manipulate truth and and substitute for truth lies and get a person or a group of people to start doubting their own sanity that somehow uh they feel disempowered that somehow their normal view of reality is being threatened and they're the ones that are made to feel that they're wrong and it's done consciously by people who are a particular type of social pathology uh, they're bullies they're dictators they're they're uh, ch abusers, either sexual abusers, child abusers. Uh, it's a it's a term, and it's it's just true that we that that this particular period of time, unlike anything I've seen in 50 years of legal practice and doing litigation and investigating conspiracies, etc., uh, I've never seen anything quite like it. Now, so many people feel dislocated that things seem to be absurd, that things don't seem to be under logical control, that. People have spent years going to school and college and even law schools to try to make clear sense out of uh, complex situations. And yet right now, there's more people functioning on the, uh, an assumption of completely different realities. Uh, for, Daniel, does some example, of this come back to, yeah. to does some of this come back to uh, we as individuals um, tending to give the benefit of the doubt to trust people in positions of responsibility to act responsibly? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's because virtually always this particular problem that we're talking about here occurs when a person in positions of authority, 
misuses that authority, abuses their authority to deceive uh, and dissemble and causing their audience or inferiors or, or subjects to, to doubt their own sanity, to doubt their own sense of reality. Uh, and uh, I've, I've dealt with people uh, for year, many years, uh, starting out in my legal practice, dealing, for example, with the Central Intelligence Agency. The Central Intelligence Agency consciously uh, makes an art of deceiving people, uh, of getting people to not understand what the real truth is, of concealing and hiding information and putting out false stories. Uh, in this particular case, to foster and promote the interests of a particular element in society, that there's a particular business element, large corporate power, the people that behind actually setting up the Central Intelligence Agency in 1947, that they, in fact, have been engaged for a long time, for example, in making people believe, a classic example, that you're not worth anything unless you buy their product, unless you own a lot of things, unless you have a new car, unless you have a, a beautiful wife or a, or a strong and wealthy husband. These types of things are being used to manipulate people in a large scale that people don't see. There are other classic small types of personal examples were a classic thing of abusive husbands are they they abuse their their spouse and they try to pretend that they're crazy that they they don't understand things that the husband just bullies them and, and insults them and demeans them etc this is a classic personal one-on-one -on -one type of experience but we're experiencing it now in our country i think you, you probably can't listen to three or four major newscasts in a given week and not hear the term gaslighting that that's what that's what this is and we're experiencing it on a national level right now and so we We've thought that it's an important thing to talk about uh, because so many people now feel dislocated and uncentered and destabilized, and it's a it's a dangerous situation because this is a, a perfect situation for a strong man or a strong person to come into position and say, "Trust me, mm -hmm. I will in fact make it, make sense out of everything. I'm the only one that understands what's going on. I'm the only one that can help you. I'm the only one that can save you." <laughs> and at the same time, they're constantly uh, bullying, demeaning people, uh, insulting people, and asserting their power in the face of people who are then felt to be feel more powerless. That's what's that's what's going on here. Daniel Sheehan, Jennifer Margulis, and Jordan Pease are guests on the Jefferson Exchange, uh, speaker, speaker, and organizer of a conference called uh, Finding Your Sanity in an Insane World, coming to Ashland on Saturday, December 14th. You can join us. Questions, comments, welcome at 800-838-3760 by phone, by email, jx at jeffnet.org. And Jennifer Margulis, I want to come to you now because the, the idea of, of not necessarily taking the the conventional wisdom or the word of people in positions of authority is pretty much the the common thread in your journalistic career, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's important to understand, I think, when you have, so I concentrate on medical and health issues. And um, as Daniel said so eloquently, there are a lot of corporate interests at play. So the more that we can get pregnant women and moms to buy things, the more people make money. And the more that we can get them to do things that we want them to do, the more that people make money. And unfortunately, we have a for-profit healthcare system, which is something we'll also be talking about at this conference, which means that, that you know, this is going to sound very negative, and I don't mean it to be negative, but I think it's true, Jeffrey, that, you know, the sicker we are, the more people benefit. So if everyone in America is super healthy and vibrant, and we have really healthy kids and really healthy pregnancies, a lot of people lose their jobs. How do you advise people to proceed uh, in, in the world that you write about with, without being gripped by fear? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, the bigger issue here is, you know, fake news and um, and how we're getting bombarded with information all the time. A lot of people keep their phones by their beds, and the first thing they do in the morning is they start reading either on social media, and then they offshoot to the, you know, NPR or the BBC, or they start clicking on clickbait. And I think it's really important to become empowered 
and to start realizing that a lot of things that seem like they're news are actually actually just aren't true. So the 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 the, the good positive takeaway here is that you can be completely empowered once your eyes are open. This is not doom and gloom. This is actually you know power and strength. Um, once your eyes are opened to the fact that everyone has a bias. So it's not just there's the there's the actual fabricated news, which is really hard to look at. But there's also the fact that you know that the FDA does something called a close hold embargo on the news, on health news. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that term, but there was an excellent investigation in Scientific American how an NPR did participate in this, even though they felt deeply uncomfortable, where the FDA will have breaking health news and they will only contact a very small subset of elite journalists and they'll tell those journalists that they are not allowed to get comment outside of what the FDA is actually um, communicating. And it's such a, I see... Uh, until a certain time? I mean, it is embargoed in that way, because we get to see those a fair amount, like embargoed until noon Friday. That so this is worse than that. I mean, this is, this is yes. And, and we all have news embargoes, right? I mean, that as a journalist, you have to, you have to respect that. That's a time issue. What a close hold embargo is, is that you actually, so it's embargoed to a certain time, but you are not allowed to step out of, um, you know, of the sources that they give you. And editors are deeply, deeply uncomfortable with this, but they are also in a catch-22, Jeffrey, because they want the access to the sources and they want the access to the news. And if they don't jump on it, you know, there's this idea that you have to be first, first to the story, right? We're very excited when we can break some news. And if you're breaking news, but you're breaking only an FDA narrative. And I do have to say that these kind of practices were happening very much under our last president, as well as under this one. So Barack Obama, who a a lot of people in this community and a lot of listeners are very excited about was actually was actually his administration was promoting a lockdown on freedom of the press and people don't know that and I don't say that to get into a Democrat versus Republican argument but no, just but Barack to Obama say, did his administration did uh, pursue journalists so with legal actions in ways that previous administrations had not absolutely and they also blocked when 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 journalists said that violates journalistic integrity I have to be able to get a comment you know that I mean that's just you know we have to be telling two sides of the story he actually would his administration denied them access to the White House it's it's very very disturbing, and it's not American. We, I believe in freedom of the press and freedom of speech, and I think we have to be able to talk about all sides of issues, especially complicated, difficult ones. I'm reading uh, something from the Association of Healthcare Journalists about the FDA banning close hold embargoes in January of 2017. Did that did that not stay banned? So, you know, all of this is happening very under the table. The only reason why we know about the close hold embargo is from a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, so I am glad to see that that kind of that they're saying that it's being banned but the kind of backroom dealings to give access to information in a controlled way are still going on to this day so jordan pease as, as a person who runs a library with lots of books and other materials I, I wonder if you ever start thinking in terms of a fahrenheit 451 world where people start complaining there's too much information it's all too confusing let's start getting rid of some of it mm. I, I hope the listeners know the reference to that film uh, not sure the date that film was released, but it certainly is a classic. And the the, the book is from the fifties, I think. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so for listeners that aren't familiar with that, the the precept, the idea there is that uh, authorities, you know, the the fire department comes and starts fires, burning burning books. Effectively, is the the thumbnail of that. Uh, so yeah. So um, it's interesting to see how um, our society is then switching over to uh, digital delivery of, of our information and, and brick and mortar books on the shelf are uh, something of a boutique idea. Jennifer's wanting to Jennifer say something Marcus as, is jumping up as, well, as an you know, author here. I, I, you know, we aren't seeing these. I, so I, my grandparents actually burned books. They were, they were communists during McCarthyism and they were, they were part of the, the communist party and they were afraid that people were going to come to their door, that the FBI was going to get so they them. they got rid of so their own books. They actually got rid of their own books, but we are seeing a modern day example of book burning. So there was a call on CNN for Amazon to take books off of Amazon. There, there, there's, there's censorship of alternative health information going on. People saying those books are, quote, dangerous. People shouldn't read them. So now, and several books were taken down. They cannot be bought anymore on Amazon in the public market. Well, it's a privately owned marketplace. But so you can still read Hitler's manifesto. You can buy it from Amazon, but you can't buy a book about autism that suggests alternative treatments that people were saying are, quote, dangerous. Now, it's very easy to 
just sling that idea around, oh, it's dangerous. You cannot give. If you start scouring the scientific journalism and the scientific peer-reviewed articles, because that's what I spend a lot of my day doing, you actually cannot find examples of these, of these treatments being harmful. But people, the call that they're dangerous was so strong that two books were banned from Amazon. I think that's modern day Fahrenheit 451. So Daniel Sheehan, in a world where there are uh, efforts to uh, to manipulate information and control information, what do those of us who consume information uh, do, or what do we stop doing first? Well, the, the most the most important thing is to to uh, rejuvenate our education system. Uh, the reality is is that our our public school systems do not, at the present time, really teach people to think independently. Uh, there's a there's a great uh, emphasis on authority and following rules, and you know always do what the principal says, do what the high school coach says, do what the mayor of the town says, what the police chief says. They bring in military people to uh, to kind of proselytize on behalf of, of uh, young uh, people joining the military. You know that that this this is what we really need to do is resuscitate the concept of a liberal education to get people to really understand that, that this is going on. Critical the thinking question, and question authority. Question, yes, critical critical thinking and, and question authority. That this is that no matter how much they pay lip service to this particular concept, in reality, almost every institution uh, tends to engage in a process of trying to manipulate and control the truth. Now that there's a there's a certain normal level of that kind of thing going on, uh, but what, what we're talking about here at the conference is that when this becomes kind of a pathology, that that uh, that for for example, uh, Karl Rove that you, you may remember was one of the advisors to George W. Bush. He one time confronted Dick Wolf, who was an activist in the Democratic Party, and says, you know, Dick, what your, what your problem is in the Democratic Party is you guys are still working with a fact-based reality. Uh, and uh, he actually said that to him. <laughs> and the, 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 what they had done, that Carl Rove had adopted this concept that George Lakoff writes about at the University of California at Berkeley, about framing, that, that you just say what it is that you think is going to be most beneficial to you, uh, and you frame the issue that way, and you just keep saying it over and over and over and over again. In the old days, we used to call that lying. Uh, uh, but, 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 but what is, if, if, you, if you frame something, if for, for, on a classic example, again, Donald Trump, here, I had the biggest audience that had ever gathered in the history of the United States to come to my inauguration. Mm -hmm. you know, and he just kept saying it over and over again. And people would put up pictures comparing his crowd to others, and he wouldn't stop. He'd just keep on saying things like that. All right, so definitely uh, question and, what's going on around us. I have to bring this a little short because we're getting and, and close one, to being one, one, time. Just say one quick thing. And the, the problem is that there's this frame that goes on, don't say anything bad about the president, because mm -hmm. that's viewed as being political. And they've even frightened radio stations, newspapers, television. You can't say anything about a president who's gaslighting and lying because he's in the Republican Party, yeah. uh, and therefore you're becoming biased. That's another that's another okay. censoring kind of frame. All right, Jordan Pease, thank you so much. Uh, Jennifer Margulis, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Jordan, uh, that's uh, Daniel Sheehan we were just talking. Jennifer Margulis, Jordan Pease. The uh, conference is called Finding Your Sanity in an Insane uh -huh. World, Saturday, December 14th at Ashland Hills. Links online at jeffexchange.org.